Good evening. Uh, thank you for joining me here this afternoon. Uh, I'm here to provide an update on a new directive and some new information that previously we did not have, and we'll be happy to share that with you all. Uh, before I get into my formal remarks, I want to thank all the folks who have been so helpful and so supportive in staying home for Nevada and doing everything that's possible to flatten the curve and to protect as many people as we possibly can, and we appreciate their diligence in doing that. So I ask them to please continue what you're doing and thank you for what you've done thus far. As of today, we have 2,000, I don't know if the slides are going up, were they, are they on the screen there? Okay. We thank you. We have 2,318 individuals in Nevada have tested positive for COVID-19, while 18,248 have tested negative. To date, Nevada has received 3,000 reagents for testing and 4,000 test swabs from the federal government. These, issue, these numbers have not changed since we reported, uh, I believe it was on Monday. As I've said before, we appreciate whatever testing components we get from the federal government. At this time, the reagents provided are not nearly the volume needed to provide the desired amount of testing that we want to do here in Nevada, and we're doing what we can on our own to build our own kits moving forward. Uh, I think the urgency uh, to expand testing is extremely important. Trust me, I know testing is a way we can determine the true scale of this pandemic. Social distancing is the only way we can end the uh, true severity scale of this pandemic. Luckily, we have some really dedicated and smart folks in Nevada working around the clock on creative solutions to expand testing. I'm speaking to those experts daily and briefed on their progress at a regular basis. I look forward to sharing those updates with you once those details are finalized. Now I want to get back to some more updates on our situation in Nevada. As of today, we have 231 new positive cases. As you can see, our total cases have steadily increased since the end of March to a total of 2,318 cases that I mentioned earlier. Part of this uptick is our ability to test uh, with UNLV and some of our other partners doing the testing, and Dr. Pandori in the North making testing kits for us. And I know as we do more testing, you will see a continued uptick and slope in the positive cases we get. Positive cases are a result of increased testing. As we get more data on the testing results, our medical advisory team will advise me on potential future steps to ensure the flattening of the curve as effectively as possible. Before I continue, I want to talk about the numbers displayed on the NV Health Response website. The COVID-19 dashboard on the Nevada Health Response website includes statewide data on laboratory tests and cases in Nevada, which is updated every day. While it is unfortunate part of the response, the number of people who have died from this virus is also included. Until today, the number of deaths have been updated on the dashboard when the information received by the state from the local jurisdictions. We've got an issue that's happened in Nevada as well as happened in other states across the country that it's reported on our dashboard when we get the data into the state uh, organization. The, when the death occurs is not being accurately reflected on the data that you're seeing. That's why you've seen a spike, you've seen zero, one, zero, and then 11 or 13 in a particular day. It's when the health districts are reporting it to the state that that's coming in one group. We're working to correct that so you can get a more accurate depiction of when the deaths are actually occurring, and we can use that to be a more effective modeling tool as well. The model is only as good as the assumptions that you make from it and the data that's put in. So in the future, you will see that reflected on our dashboard, the actual date of the uh, individual passing as opposed to the date of it being recorded and reported to the state. Uh, we said today, we sent a directive from the state epidemiologist to all healthcare providers and facilities, medical examiners, coroners, and funeral homes requiring that deaths caused or associated, caused by or associated with or related to COVID-19 infection may be, must be immediately reported to the health district and the state. Having this information allows more timely real surveillance of the COVID-19 response. Previously, as I said, the dates were based on the date they were received, not the actual date of death. This has been an issue in almost every state, and as we ramp up to provide real-time reporting increase through this crisis, we've identified it here and are fixing it. 
In order to do so, it will require the full cooperation from all individuals and entities who report to us. We need the local entities to report the figures as we're seeking them so we can post them so you get them the same way. The state's goal is to provide accurate and timely information, and I know we can do that if we all work together. As noted on the chart, we have lost 80 Nevadans to this virus. Uh, if you check the website right now, you'll see that the graph reported the total number of deaths says 77. That's because the date of the death reported of the state is pending. And sadly, uh, we will work to make this smoother in the future, and sadly, as I walked in the conference, another death has been reported, so we're technically going to be at 81 deaths. There's a lot of chasing of data, and the state is working in overdrive to make sure that the information we disseminate to you and you disseminate to your audiences is accurate and timely. The total deaths also includes at least two healthcare workers. Uh, they made the ultimate sacrifice. I don't know what I can say about this. We lost another one in Washoe yesterday. This is a nurse that worked at the hospital for seven years, uh, died for as a result of treating patients, gave her life. And if you don't stay home for yourself, stay home for the family of two healthcare workers who gave their lives trying to protect us and save us. The only thing that will stop this virus, and I'll repeat it over and over again, is social distancing and responsible behavior. I'm asking all of us to work together and keep these numbers as low as possible. In terms of the acute care, uh, acute care demand statewide, hospitalizations have been stable at 62% of the staff occupied beds, which include both COVID-19 and non-COVID-19 patients. ICU occupancy is at 71% statewide, and according to the Nevada Hospital Association, most of the ICU beds currently occupied are not, repeat, are not occupied by COVID-19 patients. There are 329 confirmed COVID-19 patients in Nevada hospitals statewide at this time. Ventilator use has increased slightly and is now at 49%. There are 889 statewide 436 are now in use. That does not include the 50 ventilators we've received from California. As I mentioned the other day, we have an order submitted to, the F to FEMA for an additional 450 ventilators and been told to expect delivery, as we said previously, 72 hours prior to our surge. The state continues to work with FEMA to monitor the usage across the state and potential surge data. Uh, according to the Nevada Hospital Association, staffing levels have been stable at an overall level of green, but as always, this continues to be closely monitored. Uh, I've got a PPE update. As of today, we have distributed 47,550 gowns, 253,640 gloves, 803 coveralls, 715,701 masks, N95 masks, 314,500 surgical masks, and 46,848 shields. The total distributed to date is 1,379,042 pieces. The state and its many partners have worked overtime to get as much PPE materials distributed to our local hospitals and health workers in as quickly as possible, and we will continue to do so. As of today, the state has distributed in excess of 1.3 million PPE items. This includes what the state had, had on hand in our stockpile prior to the pandemic and shipments we've received from federal agencies. As I mentioned the other day, we hope to include some of the private sector donations in these numbers soon. I want to thank all of those responsible for getting this protective gear to those who need it the most, including the Nevada National Guard, who are helping with the logistics of transporting these items to our providers across the state. According to the Nevada Hospital Association, PPA is currently an overall level of yellow. This means that while PPA is being used and more being distributed, we continue aggressive efforts to attain and distribute more as the need increases. And I can't thank enough our private sector task force that has been incredible in terms of raising money and procuring more items for us to distribute. All of our partners have just been uh, extremely generous and kind-hearted to provide these materials for our frontline workers. Next, I'm going to go over a few updates, including a new directive I signed today, expanding the places and situations to which our previous directives on social distancing and gatherings should apply. 
Before I get to those, I want to mention quickly two items that happened yesterday. First, the Interim Finance Committee met virtually on Tuesday and approved $6.25 million in state funding to help pay for battling the cost of COVID-19. This funding was approved by the Board of Examiners last week. This will help us leverage federal funds to purchase more PPE and other essential needs to battle COVID-19. The committee also approved releasing $2 million in settlement funds to United Way to help Nevadans with rent assistance. From the beginning, I've been transparent about my goal. Mitigate the spread of COVID-19 to save lives and protect our healthcare system from being overwhelmed, which could lead to disastrous and deadly results. As I mentioned the other day, we've been getting briefed on multiple different models and projections for Nevada. We also pay close attention to what's happening in other states, particularly in hotspot zones like New York and Louisiana. What data shows us is if we slow down the spread, we have a real chance of avoiding a situation that would overwhelm our healthcare system. The key to all of this is strict social distancing. It's the only way. Our medical advisory team has informed us that it's not just distance that matters, but also the amount of time an individual spends next to an infected person. And remember, someone can be infected without exhibiting symptoms. There are some other lessons we have learned from other states. We see, for example, some states have allowed for religious services to continue without restriction, which has been followed by a spike in new infections. We cannot allow that to happen in Nevada. We also know that eventual businesses, that even as essential businesses, can do a better job of implementing social distancing safeguards. While I still encourage outdoor activities as much as possible, we understand that some activities have unnecessarily become high risk due to people circumventing the intent and acting as if they are not susceptible to becoming infected. This is serious, folks, and I know that the vast majority of you understand that and are doing your part. You're looking out for your neighbors, your families, and the healthcare workers whose health depends on you. But there's more that we can do, and it's our responsibility to do so. That's why today, I signed a directive to firmer, further limit social distancing in a variety of contexts. Directive 013. First, I am ordering sporting and recreational venues that encourage social congregation including golf courses, public basketball and tennis courts, and publicly accessible swimming pools to close for the duration of the state of emergency. This order does not prevent you from shooting hoops in your own back backyard or swimming in your own pool. This is strictly about publicly accessible venues. Second, this directive requires showrooms at essential businesses that are used to display goods for sale, including but not limited to cars and household appliances to close to the public. You can still buy these items if the business delivers to your home, but showrooms encourage customers to wander around and touch products, and that, short of shop that sort of shopping experience can lead to a higher likelihood of spreading the disease. It's just common sense. Third, those businesses that continue operations must provide adequate protections for their workers and adopt sanitation protocols that minimize the risk of spread. This is a common sense measure to ensure businesses that are operating do so safely. Fourth, open house showings of real estate properties for sale and showing of homes occupied by renters are now prohibited. I want to be very clear, you can still buy and sell a home. Real estate agents can still use technology to virtually stage a home. And you can still make an appointment to see a house in person if it's not occupied and strict social distancing guidelines are met. But realtors can no longer hold an open house for a period of time for multiple prospective buyers to visit. I appreciate the assistance of the Realtors Association of Nevada in helping to craft this solution. Fifth, licensed barbers and stylists are prohibited from offering in-home beauty services other than to those in their household. In my previous directive, barber shops and hair salons were designated as non-essential, bringing those same services to someone's home and creating a heightened risk of exposure circumvents the very, the, the very rationale behind our initial stay-at-home directive. 
Anytime you open your home to someone not in your household, it increases the risk of spreading COVID-19. Don't do it unless it's for an essential purpose. I haven't had a haircut in six weeks. I've adjusted, the first lady is sticking by my side. We can do this. You can tell it's been six weeks. We also took a hard look at our essential businesses providing services or selling goods to the public, including grocery stores to ensure they were providing safe as an environment to the public as possible. As part of this directive, I am prohibiting all grocery stores from offering self-service food stations, salad bars, or other unpackaged bulk dry goods to customers. Unpackaged bulk dry goods are things like nuts, seeds, candy, and coffee that are sold by the scoop in large containers at some grocery stores. We don't want customers touching and retouching the same scoop handles over and over and over, jeopardizing the health and safety of all of those who utilize these stores. And right after I'm done here, the Nevada Health Response Center will issue new guidance to grocery stores, maintaining proper social distancing standards, cleaning guidelines, and other protective measures for employees and customers. Finally, after a lot of thought, thoughtful discussion and guidance from the medical advisory team, my legal team, and faith leaders from across the state, I have decided to place new limitations on participation in in-person worship services. This wasn't easy. In, trying time, in these trying times, I have clung to my faith to guide me, as I know many of you have as well. It's not lost on me that we are entering the most holy periods of many major religions. I know families want to gather to observe these high holidays, including Passover tonight and Easter on Sunday. But I know that if we allow these services to continue as usual, we will see a spike in cases in Nevada, just like we've seen in other states. Clusters will appear where people congregate. You might have heard about a religious congregation near Sacramento that health experts believe was the epicenter of a COVID-19 outbreak. The church building that the congregation belonged to had actually closed their doors on March 18th, but small religious groups gathering in people's homes led to an outbreak of at least 70 people. This outbreak example is in addition to the many examples across the country where religious gatherings at places of worship have led to COVID-19 outbreaks among their congregations. We are living in unique times, and science tells us that putting large numbers of people together during a pandemic for any reason, religious, cultural, economic, or recreational, is an invitation for disease to do its worst. That's why this new directive makes it clear that places of worship are prohibited from holding in-person worships or in-person worship services with 10 or more people, including drive-in and pop-up services for the duration of the declaration of this emergency. Religious leaders are encouraged to find alternatives to in-person gatherings, such as internet streamings to avoid endangering their congregants. This was not an easy ask of Nevadans. As someone who has attended Catholic services my entire life, I fully appreciate the power of an in-person services. Hearing a sermon, speaking with a pastor, rabbi, imam, or other religious leader, being surrounded by a community of spiritual followers. Religious services are designed to pull people together, to congregate, to commune, to pray. They're held in sanctuaries, safe spaces. They help us heal. I know how difficult this will be. I want to thank all the faith leaders throughout Nevada who I was able to talk to today and in the past week. Your support and guidance helped me make this challenging decision, and I know you'll all keep the faith alive as strong as we navigate these times. Now I want to discuss a few more updates. Battleborn Medical Corps. Earlier this week, I talked about how to sign up for the Battleborn Medical Corps. I am so pleased to announce that 475 of our fellow Nevadans have signed up to serve already. Those are dentists, dentists psychiatrists, CNAs, LPNs, students, EMTs, and paramedics. These volunteers will provide needed assistance to our hardworking medical professionals and help us care for Nevadans across the state. Now more than ever, we look to the helpers to lead us through this crisis. 
These are our helpers, and I'm so pleased to see so many of them lining up to serve Nevada. I'm so proud of these folks. I'm so proud that they are Nevadans. Again, if you want to serve, log on to SERVNV.org for more information. Again, that's SERVNV.org for further information. I'm also excited to announce our hero of the day. Julie Danner, a Las Vegas resident, is our first Nevada hero of the day. Since Monday, two days, Julie has been nominated by 11 people. In March, she started the Las Vegas Henderson Coronavirus Community Rescue and Barter to help provide meals, clothes, children's supplies, and Easter items for people in need during a COVID-19 outbreak. This Facebook, Facebook group has connected many Nevadans and started a conversation on reaching out to people in need. Thank you, Julie, for all that you're doing to help your fellow Nevadans. Again, if you know of a fellow Nevadan to nominate, Please email heroeoftheday at gmail.com with some information and a little bit about them as to why this person is your hero during this COVID-19 crisis. Do your part to stay informed. I know that the deluge of news can be hard to keep up with, and sometimes it can be hard to deal with. And I'm glad to be able to provide information if that Nevadans, to Nevadans regularly. Please continue to get your news from trusted sources, like the Nevada Health Response. You can follow us on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram now, and they'll have the latest information for you on there. Also, before I take questions from the media, I want to take a moment to say that our trusted local media organizations are being hard hit by this pandemic. The pages are smaller. There are not as many pages in there. I know reporters have been let go. Journalists have been taking cuts. Some publications have forced to go out of business. They're adapting in amazing ways to keep their employees safe and to continue to provide us the news. I know many local anchors have set up studios in their homes so that they can stay home for Nevada. If you can, please consider subscribing to your local newspaper or contributing to a Nevada news organization or a Nevada news outlet. Any small contribution is helpful to these outlets. You deserve transparency and the trust that they're working hard to keep you informed. Please support them as they support us. Thank you for your time and I now would be happy to take some questions. To, um, uh, the directive and uh, places of worship, uh, if they are if they are more than ten, for one example, I, I spoke with one church who um, said they have approval from you to do a drive-in, but it might be more than ten people as long as they're in their cars and the windows are up. Are those okay if there are more than ten people? As I long the as the directive was it no pop-up drive-in services are allowed either. None. None. Okay. Yes, sir. Governor, do you have any concerns about infringing on First Amendment rights? I have uh, spent countless hours praying on this myself, talking to faith leaders. My primary purpose is to keep people alive and to stop the spread of this disease. Scientific evidence and the experts have shown us that when groups gather together, the disease will spread. That's my major concern, and that's why I've issued this directive. Yeah. Governor, major cities across the U.S. are reporting in the past week that their black residents are being infected and killed by COVID-19 at rates disproportionate to their share of their local population. Likewise, preliminary data provided by the Southern Nevada Health District for Clark County shows that black residents account for 19% of the county's COVID-19 cases where patients and race is identified. Which is disproportionate to their 11% um, uh, of the county's population. I'm wondering if this is something that the state of Nevada is keeping an eye on in our state and what is any action is being taken right now or assessed to be taken. Well, unfortunately, and I have seen those reports come out, it was most prevalent, I think, in Louisiana where they showed it was really spiked. Uh, unfortunately, our minority communities are affected the most when you get a medical situation. The health care provided in our minority communities is nowhere near that of our more affluent communities. It's something that we are looking at. We have not tracked those statistics. I would like to get those specific statistics as it relates to those that are hospitalized on ventilators, those that have passed, whatnot, those that are infected. Uh, we currently don't have those. If they could be uh, tabulated, I'd be happy to share them with you. But it's a big concern for me. It's a very big concern. Yeah. Thank you. 
you have an idea of how many places of worship are, have been continuing to meet? I do not. All I have is anecdotal stories about people that talk about them going there and some that have been spoken of in the media. I don't know how many there are. Uh, were the faith leaders that you spoke with supportive of your decision to end services? Every single one that I said, and I didn't speak to, I'm not going to say that I spoke to every faith leader in the state, but it was probably close to 20, uh, were very supportive of the decision. Their concern is about their congregants, and they understand that this is an extremely large sacrifice, especially at this time of the year, but there, a lot of them are doing it online and streaming. I've watched Daily Mass every day this week on YouTube, and uh, it's not the same, but that's what we have to do at this time. Uh, Governor, you mentioned uh, two of our deaths in the state were health care workers. Are you concerned that we will you lose more health care workers to this in the near future? And do hospitals have adequate policies locally to protect our health care workers on the front line? Well, I'll leave it to the hospitals to decide what their policies are. We, you know, we've clearly, that's been an emphasis on PPE, and we've got a lot more coming in. And the main priority there was to uh, protect our health care workers. Uh, the battleborn. Uh, group is just absolutely incredible that we've got over 400 people have already applied that are going to get on board and be able to assist some of these health care workers. It's not just the ones that have gotten sick and the ones that have died. These folks are putting in an enormous amount of hours. I mean, they're just getting run ragged, and we've got a long way to go. This is a marathon. It's not a sprint. We need to keep these uh, folks effective and healthy for the duration. I hear the stories where now some of the hotels have opened up some of the rooms to help the health care workers stay there as opposed to going home. I know a lot of them have told me that the uh, health care worker might be sleeping in the garage and the spouse and kids are sleeping in the house because they don't want to go near them, that the best touch they get is over through a glass window or a window. Uh, that's tough. That's really tough. But we're going to do everything we can to protect our frontline workers, everything. Governor, please take my question. We've had some reports from people that may be facing eviction. It's now April 8th. Um, do you think enough is being done to stop Nevada renters from being evicted if they are, uh, I guess, applicable to uh, be uh, evicted? And is there any more rental assistance that you might be looking at to help Nevada renters? Okay. And are these questions getting picked up on the... the okay. Uh, is enough being done. You can always do more. I'm confident that I've met with the Attorney General on numerous, numerous occasions with my legal staff, Kyle George over here, to, to discuss this. We're doing what we can to protect these renters so that they're not evicted at this time and they have some security, and we'll continue to do so. If they've got a problem, call the Attorney General's office. And a follow-up question, if I may, Governor. Um, the question was asked about the CARES Act, the stimulus bill today, and specifically gaming companies, small gaming companies, were not, I guess, included in that because they have gaming. Do you have any thoughts on the small gaming, the companies that use gaming in their facilities as it relates to helping them through this tough time as well? I think it's extremely important that they get some help. I mean, they're the same as other small businesses. Uh, the, it's a big employer of ours, obviously. When we turn the lights on Las Vegas Boulevard, 200,000 people went unemployed, a lot of the local restaurants, bars, whatnot that, you know, have gaming devices in them are affected likewise, and I think they should be offered the same support. Yes. Yes. Um, further going on the eviction question, I know um, today North Las Vegas, they sent out a press release saying that they will give out penalties for any landlords or anyone going yeah. against your policies. Um, especially landlords saying, hey, you're going to get evicted. Is this something that this type of enforcement you encourage other cities throughout the state to follow as well? I encourage all jurisdictional bodies to enforce of all of our directives. Yes, I do. Yes. Uh, a couple days ago, you said you decided to keep golf courses open because it was good exercise and people could stay distance. What has changed since then? What's changed since then is I've had a multitude of pictures that were sent in to me uh, that showed that people were not uh, practicing good social distancing. They were not riding one in a cart. They were congregating on the greens. And I cannot take the chance of having it spread that way. We tried it. It didn't work because some folks, again, chose not to follow the rules. And unfortunately, as a result, we're closing golf courses. And if I may follow up. Uh, why is construction deemed an essential business? We've kept construction, mining, and manufacturing open. One, it's uh, going to help us get through this economy, but it's a lot of jobs that we're looking at here. Right now, I've got quarter of a million people have filed for unemployment. I don't want another 100,000 or more filing for unemployment if I can avoid it. Uh, they're practicing increased uh, protocols as issued by OSHA, and thus far it seems to be okay, but we're reviewing it on a regular basis. 
uh, yeah. You mentioned that state agencies need to prepare for, for budget cuts. Do you anticipate cuts or reductions to education spending that the state spends this school? Victor, I don't know what we're going to end up with. I asked them to look at everything. I mean, uh, you folks in the media know this well. I mean, you see this. Our, our revenues are falling. They're not decreasing. They went off a cliff. I mean, they absolutely went off a cliff. We went from 90-some-odd percent occupancy on the Strip down to zero. Uh, that just doesn't happen. And when it starts back up, it's going to ramp up very, very slowly. Uh, they're not going to be across-the-board cuts, but I don't know if anyone will be saved from any type of a cut. Uh, we're going to have to really tighten our belt in order to get there, and a lot's going to depend on what could come out of any further stimulus package and how quickly we're able to recover from this. But I directed all agencies to be prepared, and I encourage them to do so. Governor, you mentioned today um, <clears throat> during uh, your remarks about the lag in the reports of deaths that the state gets and why that can cause a you know, one death one day and then 11 the next, which is not correct, obviously. Right. Um, are there any other ways that your um, staff of the state or that you've heard of uh, health districts are uh, working to more cohesively report data about the outbreak in our state, whereas so that we wouldn't have, you know, more cases in the state than the counties are individually reporting? Right. And I appreciate the question. And it's, it's extremely important that we give you as accurate of information as we can, because you give it to the consumer, to, to our residents. And, and that's important. That's why I'm encouraging them to subscribe or to, to donate to news organizations, because I need you out there to pass out this information. It's frustrating when the local jurisdictions or the individual entities do it in a lump as opposed to the actual time of the positive tests or the actual time of the, the death. And that makes for inaccurate statistics, not just for you and your readers, but also for our modeling. When you show our models and it's going like this and then makes a big jump and it goes back like this, it's not done that way. It's just the way it was reported. And it really makes the model less effective. So we're working with uh, General Barry and the, both the two big health districts and Carson City to come up with a plan, a more timely reporting of this data so we can get it on the dashboard, we can get it to you, and you can get it to your readers. And we'll continue to do that. We want to correct it going back as well. When you talk about the modeling, is the, does the state have its own model, or is it relying on another one of these that's uh, been like the IHME one? Or it, when you talk about modeling, um, yeah. what are you referring to? We're doing our own modeling in terms of graphs that we have that go up, but it shows daily movement. And if the daily movement is steady as opposed to these spikes and this up and down, it makes it a lot easier to understand. So it needs to be as accurate as we can. Jack? What type of power does law enforcement have to enforce this new um, uh, guideline as far as places of worship and service? Uh, individuals who violate the, it, it's not a uh, guideline for places of worship solely, it's a guideline for all gatherings of 10 or more. And those individuals, my understanding, are subject to civil and criminal penalties. Both. Yes, ma'am. Uh, Governor, would you, in, in, you know, uh, if the social distancing issues do proceed in, you know, larger areas outside, like parks and things like that, would you consider completely shutting down any parks or trails or, you know, just further uh, upping this directive to where it's stricter, a stricter version of a lockdown? Uh, I'll consider anything if people aren't following the rules. And, and I'm and telling you this, 90 percent, 95, I don't know what percentage is, a vast percentage are following these rules. I'll give you that. And I applaud them for that. I thank them for that. They're saving a lot of lives. Uh, that That's great. But unfortunately, when I go out and I didn't see it on the golf course, but believe me, I got plenty of pictures. And I did see it when my detail took me out and I saw skateboard parks that had 30 and 40 kids skating up and down and jumping and there was no social distancing there. And next to the horseshoe pit and the bocce ball court that had half a dozen people on each one of them. Uh, this isn't a game. This is serious. People are dying. Every day I see the total and my chief of staff were walking down here. And she goes, oh, we got one more. I mean, it's like, it's nonstop. I mean, people are dying. We need to do everything we can. And when you read the stories and I get the emails of people that want to know if I can help them get in to see, you know, a family member in a hospital or two people want to go to a birth when a, a mom, a, a, the wife is giving birth and the kids want, the mom wants to be there and the husband, 
there's nothing I can do. I mean, these are heart-wrenching decisions and sacrifices that people have to make, that people can't go to their house of worship because we've got a pandemic, because someone else wants to be irresponsible and not follow the rules. I can't accept that. And we will continue to tighten the faucet, as I say, if people don't follow it. Okay. You know, obviously times are bad now, but as things get better, what are some of the measurements you're going to use to when you decide it's, it's time to start reopening the economy? Well, the things that I look at, positive testing is important, but it's not my number one parameter. Because frankly, as more testing we do, the more positive tests we're going to get. That's a given. The things that I look at on a daily basis are hospitalizations, intensive care, unit hospitalizations, ventilator usage, and uh, people who pass. Those are the ones that unfortunately, and this is sad to say and reflect upon, but when you see it, and I do an awful lot of reading and talking to people, too many people are going from hospitalization to ICU to ventilators to passing. Uh, statistic I saw, 75% of the people going on ventilators are, are passing away. I mean, it, it's severe, it's bad. Uh, so those are the statistics that I'll use the most. It's the trend of the, the data, of the graph. That's why it's so important to have the graph done correctly. It, it matters to me if that the person, when they're put in intensive care unit, that the right date is assigned to that, not a week later, and they're all lumped in at one time. It's the graph, and, and it's the medical uh, advisory team that can in interpolate that to me and help me get through that. Okay? We good? Thank you, everybody. Thank you, everyone, for watching. I want to... Uh, Wish everyone a happy holiday, whether it's Easter, Passover, or whatever it might be. And, and thank you for uh, understanding the situation that we're in. These are not easy decisions. These are not decisions I come to lightly. I uh, pray that we'll be through this, and maybe we can all say an extra prayer during this holiday season to try to uh, put an end to the spread of this virus. And for those that have given their lives and continue to battle this virus on a daily basis, thank you all very much for joining us.